Section 18 of Myths and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths and Legends of Ancient Greece and Rome by E. M. Barons. Roman Divinities Janus from the earliest ages Janus was regarded by the Romans with the utmost affection and veneration, as a divinity who ranked only second to Jupiter himself, and through whom all prayers and petitions were transmitted to the other gods. He was believed to preside over the beginnings of all things, hence it was he who inaugurated the years, months, and seasons, and in course of time came to be considered as specially protecting the beginnings of all human enterprises. The great importance which the Romans attached to an auspicious commencement, as contributing to the ultimate success of an enterprise, accounts for the high estimation in which Janus was held as the god of beginnings. This divinity would appear to have been the ancient sun-god of the Italian tribes, in which capacity he opens and closes the gates of heaven every morning and evening. Hence he was regarded as the doorkeeper of heaven and also as the presiding deity over all gates, entrances, etc., on earth. The fact of his being the god of city gates, which were called Janai after him, is ascribed, however, to the following myth. After the abduction of their women by the Romans, the Sabines, in revenge, invaded the Roman state, and were already about to enter the gates of the city, when suddenly a hot sulphur spring, which was believed to have been sent by Janus for their special preservation, gushed forth from the earth and arrested the progress of the enemy. See footnote 179. In his character as guardian of gates and doors, he was also regarded as a protecting deity of the home, for which reason little shrines were erected to him over the doors of houses, which contained an image of the god having two faces, Janus possessed no temples in the ordinary acceptation of the world, but all the gates of cities were dedicated to him. Close to the Forum of Rome stood the so-called Temple of Janus, which, however, was merely an arched passage closed by massive gates. This temple was only open in time of war, as it was supposed that the god had then taken his departure with the Roman army, over whose welfare he personally presided. It is worthy of notice, as an evidence of the many wars in which the Romans were engaged, that the gates of this sanctuary were only closed three times during seven hundred years. As the god who ushers in the new year, the first month was called after him, and on the first of January his most important festival was celebrated, on which occasion all entrances of public and private buildings were decorated with laurel branches and garlands of flowers. His sacrifices, consisting of cakes, wine, and barley, were offered to him at the beginning of every month, and before sacrificing to the other gods his name was always invoked, and a libation poured out to him. Janus is usually represented with two faces. In his special function as doorkeeper of heaven, he stands erect, bearing a key in one hand and a rod or scepter in the other. It is supposed that Janus was the most ancient king of Italy, who during his life governed his subjects with such wisdom and moderation that in gratitude for the benefits conferred upon them, his people deified him after death and placed him in the foremost rank among their divinities. We have already seen in the history of Cronus that Saturn, who was identified with the Greek Cronus, god of time, was the friend and colleague of Janus. Anxious to prove his gratitude to his benefactor, Cronus endowed him with the knowledge of past and future events, see footnote 180, which enabled him to adopt the wisest measures for the welfare of his subjects, and it is on this account that Janus is represented with two faces looking in opposite directions, the one to the past, the other to the future. Flora Flora was the goddess of flowers, and was regarded as a beneficent power who watched over and protected the early blossoms. She was held in the highest estimation by the Romans, and a festival called the Floralia was celebrated in her honor from the 28th of April to the 1st of May. This festival was a season of universal merriment, in which flowers were used profusely in adorning houses, streets, etc., and were worn by young girls in their hair. 
Flora, who typify the season of spring, is generally represented as a lovely maiden garlanded with flowers. Robigus. In opposition to Flora, we find an antagonistic divinity called Robigus, a worker of evil who delighted in the destruction of the tender herbs by mildew, and whose wrath could only be averted by prayers and sacrifices when he was invoked under the title of Averuncus or the Avertor. The festival of Robigus, the Robigalia, was celebrated on the 25th of April. Pomona Pomona was the goddess of orchards and fruit trees, who, according to Ovid, cares not for woods or streams, but loves her gardens and the boughs that bear the thriving fruit. Pomona, who typifies autumn, is represented as a lovely maiden, laden with branches of fruit trees. See footnote 181. Vertumnus Vertumnus was the god of garden and field produce. He personifies the change of seasons, and that process of transformation in nature, by means of which the leaf buds become developed into blossoms, and the blossoms into fruit. The change of seasons is symbolized in a myth, which represents Vertumnus as metamorphosing himself into a variety of different forms in order to gain the affection of Pomona, who so loved her vocation that she abjured all thoughts of marriage. He first appears to her as a plowman, typifying spring, then as a reaper, to represent summer, afterwards as a vine-gatherer, to indicate autumn, and finally as a gray-haired old woman, symbolical of the snows of winter. But it was not until he assumed his true form, that of a beautiful youth, that he succeeded in his suit. Vertumnus is generally represented, crowned with wheat sheaves, and bearing in his hand a cornucopia. Pales Pales, a very ancient Italian divinity, is represented sometimes as a male, sometimes as a female power. As a male divinity, he is more particularly the god of shepherds and flocks. As a female deity, Pales presides over husbandry and the fruitfulness of herds. Her festivals, the Palilia, were celebrated on the 21st of April, the day on which the city of Rome was founded. During this festival it is customary for shepherds to ignite a mass of straw, through which they rushed with their flocks, believing that this ordeal would purify them from sin. The name Palatine, which originally signified a pastoral colony, is derived from this divinity. Her offerings were cakes and milk. See footnote 182. Picus Picus, the son of Saturn and father of Faunus, was a woodland divinity gifted with prophetic powers. An ancient myth relates that Picus was a beautiful youth united to a nymph called Canons. The sorceress Circe, infatuated by his beauty, endeavored to secure his love, but he rejected her advances, and she, in revenge, changed him to a woodpecker, under which form he still retained his powers of prophecy. Picus is represented as a youth, with a woodpecker perched upon his head, which bird became henceforth regarded as possessed of the power of prophecy. Picumnus and Pilumnus Picumnus and Pilumnus were two household divinities of the Romans who were the special presiding deities of newborn infants. Sylvanus Sylvanus was a woodland divinity who, like Faunus, greatly resembled the Greek Pan. He was the presiding deity of plantations and forests, and specially protected the boundaries of fields. Sylvanus is represented as a hale old man, carrying a cypress tree, for according to Roman mythology, the transformation of the youth, Cyparissus, into the tree which bears his name, was attributed to him. His sacrifices consisted of milk, meat, wine, grapes, wheat ears, and pigs. Terminus Terminus was the god who presided over all boundaries and landmarks. He was originally represented by a simple block of stone, which in later times became surmounted by a head of this divinity. See footnote 183. Numa Pompilius, the great benefactor of his people, anxious to inculcate respect for the rights of property, specially enjoined the erection of these blocks of stone as a durable monument to mark the line dividing one property from another. 
he also caused altars to be raised to Terminus, and instituted his festival, the Terminalia, which was celebrated on the 23rd of February. Upon one occasion, when Tarquin wished to remove the altars of several deities in order to build a new temple, it is said that Terminus and Juventus alone objected to being displaced. This obstinate refusal on their part was interpreted as a good omen, signifying that the city of Rome would never lose her boundaries and would remain ever young and vigorous. Consus Consus was the god of secret counsel. The Romans believed that when an idea developed itself spontaneously within the mind of an individual, it was Consus who had prompted the suggestion. This applied, however, more particularly to plans which resulted satisfactorily. An altar was erected to this divinity on the Circus Maximus, which was kept always covered, except during his festival, the Consualia, which was celebrated on the 18th of August. Libitina Libitina was the goddess who presided over funerals. This divinity was identified with Venus, possibly because the ancients considered that the power of love extended even to the realms of death. Her temple in Rome, which was erected by Servius Tullius, contained all the requisites for funerals, and these could either be bought or hired there. A register of all deaths, which occurred in the city of Rome, was kept in this temple, and in order to ascertain the rate of mortality, a piece of money was paid, by command of Servius Tullius, on the demise of each person. See footnote 184. Laverna Laverna was the presiding goddess of thieves, and of all artifice and fraud. There was an altar erected to her near the Porta Lavernalis, which was called after her, and she possessed a sacred grove on the Via Salavia. Comus Comus was the presiding genius of banquets, festive scenes, revelry, and all joyous pleasures and reckless gaiety. He is represented as a young man crowned with flowers, his face heated and flushed with wine, leaning against a post in a half-sleepy and drunken attitude, with a torch falling from his hand. The Caymanae The Caymanae were prophetic nymphs held in high veneration by the ancient Italians. They were four in number, the best known of whom are Carmenta and Egeria. Carmenta was celebrated as being the mother of Evander, who led an Arcadian colony into Italy and founded a town on the river Tiber, which became afterwards incorporated with the city of Rome. Evander is said to have been the first who introduced Greek art and civilization into Italy, and also the worship of Greek divinities. A temple was erected to Carmenta on the Capitoline Hill, and a festival, called the Carmentalia, was celebrated in her honor on the 11th of January. Egeria is said to have initiated Numa Pompilius in the forms of religious worship which he introduced among his people. She was regarded as the giver of life, and was therefore invoked by women before the birth of their children. See footnote 185. The Caymanae are frequently identified by Roman writers with the Muses. Genii. A comforting and assuring belief existed among the Romans that each individual was accompanied through life from the hour of his birth to that of his death by a protecting spirit called his genius, who prompted him to good and noble deeds and acted towards him as a guardian angel, comforting him in sorrow and guiding him throughout his earthly career. In the course of time, a second genius was believed to exist of an evil nature, who, as the instigator of all wrongdoing, was ever at war with the beneficent genius. And on the issue of the conflict between these antagonistic influences depended the fate of the individual. The genii were depicted as winged beings, greatly resembling our modern representations of guardian angels. Every state, town, or city, as well as every man, possessed its special genius, the sacrifices to the genii consisted of wine, cakes, and incense, which were offered to them on birthdays. The genius which guided a woman was called, after the Queen of Heaven, Juno. Among the Greeks, beings called daemons were regarded as exercising similar functions to those of the Roman genii. They were believed to be the spirits of the righteous race which existed in the Golden Age, who watched over mankind, carrying their prayers to the gods, and the gifts of the gods to them. 
Manes, lemurs, larvae, and lares. The manes were the spirits of the departed, and were of two kinds, viz. lemurs, or larvae, and lares. See footnote 186. The lemurs were those manes who haunted their former abodes on earth as evil spirits, appearing at night under awful forms and hideous shapes, greatly to the alarm of their friends and relatives. They were so feared that a festival, called the Lemuralia, was celebrated in order to propitiate them. It appears extremely probable that the superstitions with regard to ghosts, haunted houses, etc., which exist even at the present day, owe their origin to this very ancient pagan source. The Lares Familiares were a much more pleasing conception. They were the spirits of the ancestors of each family, who exercised after death a protecting power over the well-being and prosperity of the family to which they had in life belonged. The place of honor beside the hearth was occupied by the statue of the Lar of the house, who was supposed to have been the founder of the family. This statue was the object of profound veneration, and was honored on all occasions by every member of the family. A portion of each meal was laid before it, and it was believed to take an active part in all family affairs and domestic events, whether of a sad or joyful nature. Before starting on any expedition, the master of the house saluted the statue of the Lar, and on his return a solemn thanksgiving was offered to this, the presiding deity of his hearth and home, in grateful acknowledgment of his protection whereupon the statue was crowned with garlands of flowers, these being the favorite offerings of the Laris on all occasions of especial family rejoicing. The first act of a bride on entering her new abode was to do homage to the Lar, in the belief that he would exercise over her a protecting influence and shield her from evil. In addition to those above enumerated, there were also public Laris, who were guardians of the state, high roads, country, and sea. Their temples were always open for any pious worshipper to enter, and on their altars public sacrifices were offered for the welfare of the state or city. See footnote 187. Penates The penates were deities selected by each family, and frequently by its individual members, as a special protector. Various causes led to this selection. If, for instance, a child were born on the festival of Vesta, it was thought that that deity would henceforward act as its special guardian. If a youth possessed great business talents, he adopted Mercury as his tutelary deity. Should he, on the other hand, develop a passion for music, Apollo was selected as his patron god, and so forth. These became regarded as the special divinities of the household. Small images of them adorned the surroundings of the hearth, and honors similar to those paid to the Lares were accorded to them. Just as there were public lares, so there were public penates, which were worshipped by the Roman people under the form of two youthful warriors, who in later times were regarded as identical with Castor and Pollux. They are generally represented on horseback, with conical caps on their heads, and bearing long spears in their hands. See footnote 188. End of section 18. Recorded by Anthony Wilson.